Hello everybody and welcome to the latest edition of the Royal Blue Podcast. My name is Joe Thomas, I am the Echoes Everton FC correspondent and alongside me is my colleague Connor O'Neill. Connor, we'll jump straight into it. We were both there at the Bet365 Stadium on Saturday to watch Everton clinch a, a late and, and narrow and I think we probably both agree undeserved win at Stoke. We're talking now on the Monday, less than a fortnight to go until Fulham. One more game in front of play in front of um, spectators, obviously sporting at Goodison and this Saturday. We also know there's going to be at least one behind closed doors game with Monza playing Everton on Tuesday tomorrow as we speak. What did you make of Saturday's performance and where does that leave you and your thoughts this close to the start of the season? I think you hit the nail on the head about half an hour in when you said this is enough to send a shiver down the spine with, with worry because I think first half was an incredibly tough watch, wasn't it, from an Everton perspective? Um, not very much about works, not much about right, and Everton were largely second best. Well, they did create two good chances, but you know, lar- largely second best to, to Stoke City. Um, they got better, I suppose, the more the game went on. Is, is the positive? You know, the second half was, was a little bit better to, to watch, but not not great. But yeah, it, it was worrying, wasn't it? I think leaving the the Beth 365 on on Saturday, you know, Saturday evening, Saturday night. It was worrying because you you know you you sitting there thinking well well this time in two weeks time Everton will have played their first Premier League game at home to Fulham you know and and I think the big worry was that it was almost like you're just watching a rerun of last season and not much changed and I know Dan Juma come in and we'll probably touch on him a little bit later on but you know he clearly looked a little bit behind his teammates probably in terms of fitness which is understandable mm. but also was probably not on the same page as many of his teammates I think there was a few times where he did, we went long looking for him and he was coming short and it, didn't, it wasn't really clicking but yeah I think the the overriding sense was a little bit of worry and a little bit of fear because I think we can all agree that you got the feeling that not much, nothing much had changed from what we'd seen last season I think the tone was set quite early on wasn't it I mean Evan had the kick off played it back to Michael Keane and he played a 30-yard long ball looking for looking for someone out wide on the left that just sailed out for a throw-in, yeah. didn't it? And then from that throw-in, Stoke win the knock-on, and all of a sudden you got two Stoke midfielders carrying the ball into acres of space in centre midfield, and from that they created a chance out on Everton's right, which they got a corner from, and that was basically the pattern for the next half an hour, wasn't it? There were, there were, there were two real themes. One was Stoke's dominance of, of a midfield that was largely non-existent for Everton, um, and, and the second the second theme, obviously, and another key talking point from Saturday was just how I don't think Stoke were generally bruising, but they did seem to target Dwight McNeil, maybe just because he was perhaps a little bit quicker and a little bit more assured uh, than a lot of his teammates. He, you know, he, he did look in good nick, to be mm. honest, danced around a few players. But within half an hour, two Stoke players were in the book already for bad tackles on him. Um, you know, and he'd already been on the ground three times in pain, and obviously, you know, come the 70th minute, it was a fourth time. And there he goes hobbling off, and yeah, you know, that's obviously a real concern, isn't it? I think we'll come to Dwight McNeil later, but although things did improve a bit in the second half, that first half, that first half an hour, and bearing in mind it was probably close to what we'd consider to be a full strength side yeah. Everton at the moment, if they have a we have r- relatively recent experience of this because the Fulham game a couple of months ago in April was probably the worst opening half an hour that Everton put in under Sean Dyche and it, it cost them. Although they got back into the game after it, it was, it was a worry with the game having so much importance on it. If Everton start against Fulham on, you know, on August the 12th in the same way that they started against Stoke last Saturday, it's going to be a similar scene, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it will, and you know, let's, make, let's make no bones about it. Fulham are a lot better than Stoke City are. You know, I know Stoke uh, finished mid-table in the championship season last season. They've got hopes of maybe getting the playoffs this made season. Made a lot of new signings, haven't they? They made a lot of new signings, but and, and of course, just to jump in, in fairness to them, there because their season starts a week early, they are obviously further along in their yeah. pre-season plans, aren't they? Well, they they said I think Alex Neil said afterwards didn't he, that they they treat, they treat that as a trial run for this Saturday's opener against Rotherham. They mm-hmm. they treat that you know as serious as they possibly could. But yeah, I think. That was the worrying thing, is you're thinking if this is Fulham, Everton are playing, they'll probably be behind by now. And the, the moment that summed up for me was about 20 minutes in when Michael Keane let the ball bounce. Then James Tarkovsky had his in his attempt to clear, and all of a sudden it was only the fact that Pickford was so quick off his line, it was then pre- prevented sort of Stoke getting on goal. And you kind of think, well, you know, Tarkovsky's normally Mr. Mr. Assured at the back, and even he's hesitating, and, you know, the Everton were just not at the races, and I think. 
you know, it's understandable, you know, I know there's a lot being said about like how hard they're working behind the scenes and, and Dice just done pre season training pre season kind of training regime has been quite grueling. But there was still kind of an excuse for that on Saturday because the basics were all wrong. Like, you know, Everton couldn't find a blue shirt. I mean, the, the midfield, you know, single and Abdullah Decore and just gonna get out. They they literally couldn't find a blue shirt when they had the mm. ball. The passing was terrible. Jordan Pickford's distribution wasn't great. And, you know, if you can't get the basics right, that's what kind of happens and you just got to hope that you know everything you know that's one out the system now and you know and things will look a lot brighter on Saturday because it's against Sporting but yeah it was a worry and I think you know there's a lot of factors why it's a worry isn't it because you know and we'll, I'm sure we'll get on to Sean Dyche's comments but obviously you know he spoke after the match for the first time this pre-season you know he had a lot to say but it wasn't all positive I think and has and, and it's probably got alarm bells ringing for supporters and it was just it just felt like one of them afternoons where any kind of worry that fans had in the back of the mind going into this new season by the time we got to you know Sunday Sunday evening 24 hours on that worry was at the forefront of fans' minds because the season is we're in touch and distance now and, and things don't look like they've changed too much that's it I think that worry was probably exacerbated by a few different things on on Saturday obviously we went into the game fresh with the news that Albert Altori something that Evan had tracked for a while I'm not sure that they'd ever actually got within touch and distance of him but they were clearly looking at him and hopeful of of, of, of landing someone who has a similar profile of player to Dominic Calvert-Lewin which would obviously solve a lot of the attacking problems but obviously you know, a couple of hours before Atalanta confirmed that they've signed him that didn't help then the other issue was obviously Dwight McNeil coming off after 70 minutes I mean Evan struggled for goals at the best of times under Deitch, Dwight McNeil was one of their best players, ended up with seven goals um, last season and was a, a real key component of the side that got out of relegation. Evan's success in that battle, we think back to, I think his performance at Brighton uh, back in that bank holiday in May was probably the best individual performance of an Everton player all season. Certainly an outfield player of Everton. You know, the only other game I think that would come close would probably be Pickford against Liverpool in the derby at Goodison Park quite early on the season. But you know, his early goal against Brentford, you know, McNeil was absolutely, in, you know, he was he was pivotal to, to Sean Dyche's Everton survival bid. Seeing him hobble off, we haven't had an update. You know, he didn't leave on a stretcher. He was able to go off on his own steam. Um, so you know, we probably don't want to labour it too much. But Everton can't really afford to lose such a crucial player this close to the start of the season. Bearing in mind how few recruitments they brought in, can they? No, they can't. And and this hammers home what. All our concerns isn't about recruitment and transfers so far this summer because when you look at the squads and you, you look at what Everton have got and you think, well, okay, you know, if they get the best level on the pitch, the team could, should really be, if I'm being honest, the team should comfortably be mid-table in the Premier League if they get the best level on the pitch more weeks than not. Already, you know, we haven't kicked a competitive ball yet and, and Everton have lost one of their better plays. Okay, we don't know how long for, but the fact Dwight McNeil limped off the way he did was a worry because you look at the options and you look at who could come in okay you know Dan Juma could go out and play out wide but then you're losing him up top which means more players have to play as things stand um, and obviously you know you say there but the two the two big issues obviously there was a third because Dominic Calvert-Loon again was not included in the matchday squad so it all kind of ties in I think in this whole recruitment transfer talk which I know we've debated long and hard and we'll continue to debate long and hard about in the, in the coming weeks but it all comes back to that recruitment doesn't it and transfers because when you've got a paper thin squad which Everton have got and one that's not listed with great attacking options when you lose an attacker like Dwight McNeil who I think as well on Saturday he was probably one of Everton's better players in terms of you know he tried to get on the ball he tried to get forward he tried to make things happen just like he did the second half of last season when you lose that kind of direct and creativity it's gonna it's gonna show and obviously you know with the continued rumours over to Mari Gray's future you know continuing you kind of think well if Everton lose him it's almost like they're losing two plays because that means obviously maybe Dan Juma has to go out wide but then he's taking from playing up front and, and Neil Moore here giving them out so yeah it was a real blow and you can just you know keep your fingers crossed it wasn't too serious and maybe he was just taking off as a precaution you know maybe Sean Dyche looked at it and thought well you know like he alluded to himself earlier Joe he'd had one or two kickings before that that was a third or a fourth one you know, there's, there's no point kind of him tr- carrying on and potentially doing more damage. Let's just get him off and, you know, look after him and wrap him in a cotton wool. But, yeah, it, it was concerning. And, you know, I know Everton went on to win the game, but it, it, there was, like I said, leaving, leaving the best 3 6 5 on Saturday, it was just an over an overriding feeling of worry, I think, for, on, on a number of, of fronts. And McNeil's injury was, was kind of the ice on the cake. A couple of positives I, I, I did take from the game. Obviously, it was good to see James Garner back in Everton shirt. Um, and I also thought that Patterson looked 
he, would, he tried really hard down the way. It didn't always come off, and there were times when, you know, his his decisions to go forward and then have and lose the ball, and all of a sudden they're, they're exposed down the right because he's so far up the pitch. But he looks a little bit more dynamic than he and a little bit more confident going forward than he has done previously. Uh, put a few good balls into the box in the second half. The problem being that those balls in the box are aimed at you know diminutive five for eight Neil Morpe against two towering centre backs. Everton can't be in a situation where that's repeated going into the season. Also thought Amadou Anana obviously got the goal in, in in stoppage time, but I thought he I thought he was a big part in Everton putting in a, a better second half showing. But ultimately, this all comes back to the striker issue, doesn't it? Because I think. It was good to see Dan Juma play his first 45 minutes in Everton uh, in an Everton shirt. He didn't really have a kick at the ball. He didn't really have a chance. Obviously, he played up front by himself and was essentially the, the 4-5-1 slash 4-4-1-1 with Decore pushing up when he can that Dice utilised for so much of last season, which is probably his favoured tactic going into this season as it stands. I was quite reassured after the game by what Sean Dice said. First time he's spoken to the media this summer apart from when he spoke to, to the Echo in in France and the way that he portrayed Dan Juma's performance was this was about minutes and fitness not about tactics essentially he played up front on by himself but it was very clear in what Sean Dyche was saying after in the piece that I've written for that's, that's already out there today that Sean Dyche clearly doesn't see him as playing that role in you know in, in his first choice lineup he doesn't see Dan Juma as a an out and out forward as a number nine he's going to lead the front line and get the goals he sees him as somebody that's a, going to probably play a supportive role either out wide on, on one of the wings or perhaps you know playing off a, a target man I mean striker preferably Dominic Calvert-Lewin and I think when you look at Dan Juma's attributes I think we can probably see that that is where he would be best utilised so that's good that Sean Dyche isn't there labouring under what I think we'd agree would be a misapprehension that Dan Juma can play up top by himself and solve the problem when Dominic Calvert-Lewin's there but obviously what it does do is it, it just drives home that need to either have Dominic Calvert-Lewin fit or to have somebody that can of a similar profile who Dan Juma can play off you know when Dominic Calvert-Lewin isn't available and that is an issue that, and we're going deep into a third transfer window in a row now, where that's been a priority and it still hasn't been resolved. How nervous are you about that? I mean, I said last week, didn't I, you know, after we talked about touring, it looked like he was going to go to Atalanta, even though Everton had had that interest in him. Um, that, you know, Everton needs to have a list of targets ready to go for there and then after they knew they weren't going to get Torre. Um Obviously, there's names getting banded about, but they, we're almost now, and I know we, we spoke about this in the car, and we're back on Saturday, of we're almost now in a position where are they just in the position where they just need to get a centre forward in because they they can say they've signed a centre forward, then actually a centre forward who can can play the way Sean Dyche wants to set the team up to play. And because some of the names we haven't have been linked to it, I don't think Nessie can play the way Sean Dyche wants to wants to set the team up and prefers to play. And look, I mean the, the biggest problem Everton have got is Dominic Calvert Lewin is so good when he's fit. Kind of one of the things that Everton do have a problem with is the fact that when Dominic Calvert-Lewin is fit he's quite a unique type of striker isn't he? his profile there are lots of target men out there that can do that kind of job but there are a few like Dominic Calvert-Lewin can also play with their back to goal so well and can also crucially to how Everton have played under Dyche when he was fit against Brighton for instance is he can he can run the channel so effectively can't he yeah and, and if Everton were to try and replace or bring in a like for like replacement for Dominic Carvalho and he doesn't cost a lot of money it's money that the club don't have at the minute and that's you know abundantly clear isn't it I think he, the prime example of Calvert and so how effective he is is, is Solma Rondom in the sense of I think Solma Rondom is a, a really good hold up back to goal you know kind of average centre forward in, in the sense of you know you think of like what he's done at Newcastle and places like that where you know he'd be hard to play against big strong but then you look at when he used to come in and everyone does expect that a little bit more because what they used to with Calvert-Lewin. But it's tough to then run the channels and, and be a natural finisher in front of goal, which Calvert-Lewin is. So, yeah, it, it's it's a real tough task for Everton to try and replace Dominic Calvert-Lewin. But I think it's one that now is a little bit alarming because, like you say, we've had three transfer windows to bring in a centre forward. And, you know, Everton are kind of haven't been able to do that so far. They might still do that. You know, this obviously is still, this transfer window is still ongoing. But, you know the fact that we are now in you know July heading to August, and Everton is still on the home for a centre forward, is a little bit worrying. And I think the big problem, the big thing with Calvert Lewin, we had obviously, you know, as one of the journalists in the, in the huddle with with Sean Dyche after when he spoke about Dom and 
although it was you know nice to have an update from the manager and hear that things are you know going quite well Everton fans are just sitting there listening so I think well we've heard all this before you know we heard this last season under Frank Lampard we've heard this you know and I think the problem with Everton fans are they're grown frustrated and it's probably no one's fault and Everton are probably managing them the best Calvert doing the best they can Calvert can only do so much but the fact that they've been able, unable to bring in a centre forward makes everything just feel that little bit more kind of like, oh, here we go again. And it shouldn't be like that. You know, Everton should be in a position now where they've got another centre forward in who takes the beard and off cat and the pressure off Dominic Calvert Lewin and the club. There has to come a point, really, do you think, where Everton's situation with past three transfer windows has been similar. There isn't much money, and one of their priorities has been finding somebody that can do a job either alongside challenge or instead of Dominic Calvert-Lewin. We, we, we've spoken about how hard it is to replicate how he plays and what he brings to a team. And we've spoken about how expensive um, finding a, a, a trusted recruit in that profile is. At some point, do you think Everton should almost consider just changing the way in which they play? And, 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 it, and where I'm kind of going with this is, I think my fear going into the final month of this transfer window is that we see a repeat of last summer where when you look at that Neil Mopé signing now, it looks very much like, and you know, they have a very difficult job, but the way in which everything has materialised for Mopé, it almost feels like they got to a position where they thought we just need to sign a striker yeah. rather than we, can on- we should only sign a striker that fits the style in which we're looking to play because it clearly wasn't if there was a plan for Neil Mopé to come into that Everton side and do a certain job either they shied away from it once they brought him in or he hasn't been good enough to do the job that they're asking of him which isn't clear when we see it on the pitch but maybe he just hasn't Mm -hmm. you know done what you know Everton Lampard and co thought he might be able to do when, when he came in do you think the, with a month to go now if all or a lot of the avenues in relation to Dominic Calvert-Lewin have been explored and hit dead ends at some point they've probably got to consider trying to do something different haven't they and, and, and if so do you think do you think now is the time or do you think now you persevere with you know, with plan A I think that, that that's more of a question for Sean Dyche isn't it because I think he's very much set on how he wants to set the team up and how he wants to play and, and he's probably got a belief in the best way to set Evan up to avoid relegation or being, being you know being in a relegation battle which probably might not necessarily go and check with what the club's recruitment team want to do you know and this, this all comes back to like structure doesn't it and you know everyone being on the same page and everyone reading from the same hymn sheet and stuff like that I, I think the thing with Sean Dyche is he will probably have an, a, a belief of well from a 1 to 11 point of view the way I set the team up is the way I see best fit to get the best out of most of these players to avoid being a, a, a repeatable player in last season. Well, you said it earlier, you said, you said the first 11 Everton, you think they could potentially get to a, a mid-table position and I think there's probably a degree of truth in that if you put Dominic Calvert-Lewin on that, if you tell us now that he's going to start 32 games, he's going to play at least an hour in 32 mm. games next season, you could probably make, you, you, I mean, there's, there's a very clear gamble in that you're relying on key players in certain areas other than Dominic Calvert-Lewin mm-hmm. to stay fit for substantial parts of the season including Jordan Pickford James Tarkovsky in particular um, but if they can do that then there probably is a 13th 14th yeah. 15th available to them but I think if anything the last two years has probably taught it should have taught Everton that in you know it doesn't matter whether it's goalkeeper up front centre backs full backs as we saw became such a problem last season it's it's a very, very risky business relying on a very small core of players, isn't it, to try and get you through a season. And and the drop-off from, say, first 12, 13 players on that team sheet to then 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, it's quite substantial, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, but I think Everton, you know, unfortunately, because of recent events in, in, in history, have now found themselves in a position where they have to rely on a small number of players and, you know, squad members doing specific jobs in specific areas because like I say you know we always come back to but you know Sean Dyche himself didn't have to he's not going to have a war chest and you know he's not going to be afforded the luxury that you know pre- some of his predecessors have had at the club but it's because of them predecessors that Sean Dyche never find himself in the position that they are now where you know they are having to 
say gambles. I said this, you know, you know the other week where we talked about Galvez and George Pickford and the goalkeeper area. And you know, ideally, you would probably like to think Everton are bringing a backup goalkeeper this summer to so place Asmir Begovic, or you know, at least maybe made Begovic an offer that he, he he wouldn't say no to. But the fact of you know they had to take gambles somewhere in the pitch and goalkeeping area looks like one. There's probably going to be more gambles taken by by the club because they're not going to be able to bring in strength in every position. We spoke last week to me about just the centre back situation and, and where you know and it's it's quite interesting that so many people believe Evans should sign a centre back this summer but yeah you know the, the t- at the moment in time they've got five or six options of centre back it's not going to bring in they're not going to pay money to bring one in when they've got five or six options already available to them that's why I think the forwards is so important because they don't have options available to them and they need to bring someone in and, and every could be every penny they've got we'll probably have to go into bringing a centre forward in but you are right I think you know the they're basically you know let's face it Evan are basically hanging the hat on a bit of a miracle as things stand and hoping and praying that they don't lose key players throughout the season you know if Evan starts to pick up injuries during the season which we all touch what they don't but if they do then you know this could be a long hard season and one which everyone everyone said they go well that was a bit naive and that's stupid but I think the position the club find themselves in they've just got they've got to take risks they've got to gamble that's part of the problem as well though isn't it because if you say for instance and obviously this is a not quite a worst case scenario there's a chance this might be the case hopefully it's not but when you look at Fulham in less than a fortnight say for instance Dwight McNeil's knock is enough mm. to keep him out of contention for that game and say for instance Dominic calvert and for all the, the, the positive noises that have been made about his progress in training and, and hopefully we'll see him against you know Sporting and I imagine that the, the behind closed doors against Monza feels like a perfect opportunity yeah. to start bringing him into a more competitive um, pre-season routine but say for instance those two are out you probably end up in a situation where even though he doesn't see him as this posi- see him as this position, you're probably in a situation where Evan are playing four five one with Dan Juma starting up top, even though Deitch is aware that he's yeah. probably not a leading man. You're probably in a situation where without Dwight McNeil, you then have Ashley Young playing at left wing, and great, it's good to have him in the as backup. But Vitaly Mikolenko hasn't played a part in preseason so far. wasn't involved again the other day. wasn't involved in any of the the, you know, the training pictures or footage that, that the club released at the back end of, of, of last week so all of a sudden you could end up in a situation where just like they did at the end of last season you know, Everton and then starting with someone like you know, Ben Godfrey or Mason Holgate at, at left back obviously it wasn't even that by the Bournemouth game it was Dwight McNeil at left back yeah. um, and, uh, and James Gar- Garner at right back but you can very very quickly see how just a small number of even minor knocks really do shake up that Everton side don't they well it's, it's- Round pegs to square holes, isn't it? Quite, quite, just quite simply, you know, it's it's plays playing out of position. Again, we saw just how much, you know, Fulham was one of those games where you saw just how much an opposition side could have joy against an Everton side that played centre backs at full back. Yeah, and also I think you know you look at like the Fulham game, how derailed Everton were by just Amadou and Arna missing that game. So obviously he missed missed that game, didn't he? And Dom was obviously still out. You know, so you know two or three people out and Everton were you know all over the show. And like we say there, you know the, the prospect now is to start in the season with two or three people out of position and square pegs and round holes. And, and let's not forget this is a hit, a repeat of last season, isn't it? When you think of Anthony Gordon starts the last season up front because Calvert Lewin picked up that knock against uh, in, in trading the build up to the game, and then obviously. The club couldn't bring anyone in, so it was kind of square pegs and round holes again. And you know, we've alluded to this already on, on the pod, but Evan have got quite a favourable start, and they can't be afford to be throwing fixtures away early doors. And you know, but already, like you say, you're sitting there thinking, well, the squad looks a bit threadbare, people are going to have to ask players to position, and it's just not the it's not the signal or the, the sign you want to send out is not on the opening day the opening day should be you know you're a full strength with one or two new signings ready to make the, the Premier League debut and, and ready to hit the ground running you don't really want to be starting the opening day with players out of position players having to play you know do jobs and, and, and the, the, the bench being made up of youngsters and stuff like that you don't want to be sending that signal but there's a very possi- real possibility as things stand that that could be how Everton start this season which you know would be a bit of a disaster for being honest and, and Questions then would brightly be asked of not just you know Sean Dyche but Kevin Fellow and the club's recruitment team of how Evan have found themselves in that position once again. But you are right, I think it is a worry because we aren't that far away from seeing Everton playing with, with square pegs and round holes. And you know, considering that's the opening weekends of the season, it's 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 quite shameful, really. Yeah, it'd be a real, a real disappointment. I think one other 
one other takeaway that we we could collect i think from the other day and from pre-season in general just moving away from from some of the ta- tactical and, and transfer elements is once again we saw james tarkovsky with the captain's armband and and for a second time this pre-season it was with pickford in goal obviously pickford was the vice captain to seamus coleman last season looks like Tarkovsky's going to take up that mantle this season doesn't it it does yeah I asked Sean Dyche this, this after the game I said you know what, what is the plan and you know Sean Dyche was quite firm and, and you know shot back straight at me in terms of you know no, James Coleman is club captain and will remain club captain but interestingly he did say things will stay as they are if, if, if Seamus isn't, isn't around basically so we know can read into that I think that James Tarkovsky will be Everton's you know, new vice captain and will wear the armbands I don't think this you know we didn't get the chance to push Sean on this too much afterwards but I, I don't think that's probably a thing of Pickford's you know leadership skills or anything like that uh, are coming to question it's just probably maybe that thing of some managers don't like cap- the captain being a goalkeeper. You know, we see it a lot, don't we? A lot of managers like their captain to be an outfield player because they can influence the game. They can, you know, speak to the referee on a regular basis. All, all um, small minor details that may make a big difference. And maybe Sean just thinks, you know, last season he came in and stuck with this. He didn't want to maybe rock the boat too much and start making wholesale changes. But this time round, he, he maybe wants a, an outfield player as the captain when Seamus isn't isn't in the round the team. And so you know, we can't presume that. You know, talk James Tarkovsky has things stand will be the man to lead Everton out on the opening day against Fulham because you know I think Seamus is still quite a few number of weeks away from from even being in contention to return. So it's an interesting move, but I don't think it's one that will surprise people. And look, I don't think Jordan Pickford losing the armband is going to make him any less quiet because he was still an incredibly vocal figure even when he didn't have the armband on, and he'll still lead by example and he'll still be still one of Everton's best players. Isn't he? Let's face it, you know he's probably one of the only players you could put in the real upper class category. So I don't. I don't think it'll be that make too much of that making a difference. And we saw last year, I mean, Connor Cody was a captain without wearing the armbands at the times, you know. So I don't think it'll make that too much of a difference. But from a you know a, an insight point of view, I think you know Sean Dyche has clearly made his mind what he wants to do. It's an interesting one, though, isn't it? Because I mean, Jordan, you know, Frank Lampard made Jordan Pickford the captain for the very first time in his in his career yeah. uh, at Turf Moor at Burnley back end of, of that season. It was certainly something that Pickford was very very proud of and. You know, I think he he did in, enjoy having that leadership role and took a great deal of pride in you know, knowing that he would go down in, in Everton's history as a, as, a, as a captain. So it is going to be an interesting. But like you say, I think we do get the impression that Sean Dyche is somebody that has a few mantras and is stuck in his way. It's not necessarily a negative thing, but he has a certain way of doing things, which has obviously proved successful to him you know, at certain points in his career. And, and you imagine this being more of a kind of a, a principle rather than a personal decision, if that is and that going to be the case. Close to wrap it up now. Obviously, it's it's been quiet on the transfer front. You know, I, I know that they Tory, are they are very uh, wise words, Joe. <laughs> One way putting uh, it. I know, that, I know that I know that Tory got confirmed on Saturday, but yeah. really we we knew what was where that was was going. Few players haven't a linked with Kelechi and Acho being one of them. There's a bit of interest. Obviously, we've spoken about the importance of getting somebody of the profile of Dominic Calvert Lewin. If that's how Everton want to play. I think that there's merit to bringing Ian Acho in. I think he's a good player that can score goals in the Premier League, but obviously he doesn't fit that profile, which yeah. is yeah, we, we would be interesting if he was to bring him in and, and, and how that would that would influence how it would line up. Outgoing's also quieting down a little bit as well, hasn't it? I think Mason Holgate, we anticipate Everson would be willing to listen to offers on. Not really been any progress there. Damari Gray, it sounds like Besiktas are very interesting. I think, I'm not sure they've gone as far as a formal bid, but I think they've had discussions with Everton and I think they've been trying to pitch him around the £6 million mark. It's the other side of Everton's problems, isn't it? I think if we think that Everton need to sell in order to buy, they obviously need the money in as soon as possible. And as a result of that, whilst... Yeah, Damari Gray's got one year on his contract left. Obviously, the club do have it, the option yeah. to, to, to extend that. There is the danger that Everton have where they end up getting lowballed by clubs that think that they might be, you know, too you know, desperate enough to take in, you know, take in what are lower than than than, than you know, market value options. And it? it's a difficult situation that they find themselves in, isn't it? Yeah, because we've we've, we've all wrote and said, haven't we, that you know. A Everton squad needs a trimming. It needs a balancing out, and it needs to become fit for purpose. You know, it's not fit for purpose as things stand because it's lopsided in some areas and and extremely short in other areas. You know, like I say, you look at the centre back. There's probably six options of Sean Dyche's disposal, but yeah, he's got one centre forward to, to pick from at the minute. Um, but yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think there's not just the transfer fees and the club, but also wages. 
you know, trying to offload. And this isn't just an Everton thing now, I don't think, you know, probably trying to offload a, a Premier League player is quite difficult unless they're really in high demand because of the wages, you know, Premier League players in a lot, a lot of money, you know, not just at Everton. And, you know, if you're a, a Sheffield United, for instance, maybe interested, you are interested in, in, in Mason Hallgate, but then you look at what he earns and what he would want and what Everton would want to, to, to make a deal, even just a loan deal in terms of the percentage of wages. They're probably looking at it thinking, well, you know, we've got a bit of a wage structure already in place and that would take us well above. And, you know, if we give that to him, then all of a sudden every other player we go and try and sign will, will, will be aware of what he's on and want that. And it's a domino effect, isn't it? It's a, it is a real domino effect. And, you know, Kevin Farewell's got a, probably a tougher job on his hands of offloading some of these players as he has recruiting players. Because, like I say, there's probably not, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, it makes Mason Hall into my game. Andre Gomez is probably another example of someone who, you know, we know for a fact Leo would be interested in taking them back, but you imagine Leo would struggle to cover his wages. You know, taking his wages full, you know, full time because John John Philippe Gabamin, another John person Philippe to add Gabamin, that list. A, another you know, one, yeah, injured as well. So the, you know, these players are high-profile Premier League players who are probably on good contracts and have still got time left on them contracts. So that makes it even, you know, makes it the job even harder. And like I say, I think. Kevin Felwell's got a battle on his hands to bring players in. He's also got a battle on his hands to get players out. And, you know, it would be nice if they could try and get, you know, six million for Damari Gray and six million or five million elsewhere for players. But football doesn't really work like that. And every club is looking for the, the, the bargain, aren't they? Every club is looking for the, the right deal. And, you know, I think as well with loans, which you suspect maybe Mason Hoggett might go out on loan in the end. They normally come towards the end of the back end of the transfer window anyway, aren't once the season starts. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult. And, you know, like I say, I think it, it's probably just as equally as hard for Kevin Fell to get some of these plays off the books as it is to get to get plays in. If you were, you know, obviously there's a, there's a month month to go now. What, are there any players that you think might be available that you'd be particularly keen to see? Everton bring in. Like, being realistic. I, the, the I one, at the the, minute and I, and I kind of, for me, I think Everton need, they need a striker and they need yeah. a right winger and they clearly don't have a lot of money. Um, I... The two that I think I I would hope they'd be targeting, I think I don't think it'd be unrealistic. I, I think Broge is going to be an interesting one at Chelsea. Mm. Yeah, we've seen they've just won the Premier League series out in America, uh, and and Kunku and, and Jackson have, have, have partnered and done well yeah. for them out there. Broge coming off the back of a long term injury, he scored goals for Southampton, didn't he? When he when he played, and he obviously did play in a. In a in a traditional striker's role it's a gamble with injuries of course but obviously after they're mm. in a difficult situation I'd like to see him throw in a cheeky bid and just see what yeah, happens yeah. on there and I wonder the other one I wonder is someone like um, like Ahmad Diallo at Manchester United obviously Alanga hasn't worked out for them it's hard to um, Ahmad has been out in America with with um, Manchester United I think he's been getting minutes as well and you know he's far from a proven Premier League player of course he is and he was out but he had a good season with Sunderland last season and, and I think that yeah, Man United fighting on as many fronts as they will be next season. They will want to probably keep hold of, mm. of, of of squad players, and we saw that Eric Ten Hag is probably quite cautious in that approach. By the way, he kept on hold of Anthony Alanga, even yeah. though he's only a bit part player. You know, in back end of last season, you know, he, they refused to sanction and move for him to Everton, who was so so desperate for him. But someone like someone like Ahmad, you know, those type of players where you could see there's a mutual benefit there to both clubs if if they were to get minutes. That wouldn't be a bad finish to the window, would it? Would no, and it, and it, above all else, it fixes major gaps that are currently, you know, holes in Everton squad that currently exist. So that wouldn't be a bad finish. The one who I want, the one, I mean, he's, he's long gone now, but he will return. He will be good on Saturday. Was Victor Gorkes, you know, a Coventry. There was, I watched him last, when Everton first got linked to him, I think it was December last year, and I watched him a few times for Coventry, and then so you watched him towards the back end of the season when they were in the playoffs and stuff like that. And he was one that I was fascinated by and would have liked Devon to go for because he had something about him he was a big strong lad probably not as good as Dom, not as good as Dominic Calvert-Loon but a bit of a turn of pace could score goals in the championship okay it's a massive step up but there was something about him that I thought he could got something on this kid and you know it'd be good to see if we could maybe try and get him you know and bring him obviously you know Everton we don't know Everton we're really in the running for him obviously quite, quite well, I think one of the interesting things is when you go back to the final days of the transfer window last summer you know the noises coming from the club were that you know there might at that point they hadn't signed Garner and Gay they both came in on transfer deadline day but while there was a, a general awareness that those deals were progressing in advance and something that Everton were looking at there was also a sense that 
they might end up putting in a late bid for someone like Ben Brereton Diaz or Victor mm-hmm. Gocker is. And it's hard not to look back on that. Obviously, we know that the financial situation wasn't great. But bearing in mind that they went and committed to the best part of £15 million on, on Neil Mope, given the... Though both of those strikers became more valuable to those clubs as the season went on yeah. because probably unexpected for both clubs they got to a position where by Christmas they were both in the hunt for Premier League football mm. and at that point what do you do what's more valuable to you the 10 million pounds for in- obviously 10 million pounds it looks like they didn't have but yeah. 10 million pound for for us for to you, in, in the bank to, for your best striker or the prospect of him firing you into the Premier League football yeah. and the tens of bit of millions of pounds that that could could bring you in. Now, we don't know if either of them would have done a good job for Everton, but it's hard to say, and obviously we, we are operating with the benefit of hindsight, but Everton wouldn't have been worse off with either of those last season, would they? It does feel like a bit of a missed opportunity 12 months later with both of their value having then shot up so much in January. Coventry obviously getting around 20-odd million pounds for Gokhrez in, 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 in the end. feel a bit of a missed opportunity, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, again... Brendan and Diaz was someone I wanted Evans to sign last summer. You know, I, I think I don't know. We don't know. Low risk, weren't we? Don't, we don't. We don't a lot of things on like strikers and stuff. And he was one I thought Evans should have took the gamble on and went and got. You know, I think. You know, I don't think Evans had really had much to lose last summer. I think you know you look at the the fifteen million he spent on Neil Mope. They could have easily went and spent that on Ben Brendan and Diaz and and took a gamble. And we probably would have been no worse off now than what we what we are. You know, so yeah, I think it, it, like when you're looking hindsight like now, Everton did miss a boat. And I think they did. You know, I think they did inquire about Gorkas in January towards the end. But by that point, like you say, Coventry was so far in the playoff hunt, been taken over as well. Yeah, they? that that they were kind of like you know, and and look, you know, that plan nearly worked for Coventry because they were you know were in touch and distance being promoted to the Premier League. So they would have got hundreds of millions of pounds if they would have you know if they'd got over the line at Wembley back in back in May. So yeah. I think you know it does look like a missed opportunity and that's why I think now it's so difficult because there's not an array of options out there you know last summer they felt like there was Berrett and Diaz Victor Gorkers they, they felt like there was a few options out there who haven't could have explored obviously they went for Neil Mopay this time around it doesn't feel that way does it it doesn't feel like there's a lot of options out there for Everton and you know you look at Ian Acho is, is one name that's been manned about soon I don't think Ian Acho's a bad player but I think he's a forward I would have won seven to sign haven't already brought in another forward you know so maybe as a he could have come in and played the role off a bench, for instance, or played the odd game. When, but you know, twenty minutes to go, Everton need a goal. You know, they can bring them on. You know, and, and play that type of role. I don't. He doesn't fill me as the type of bloke. The person who is the, the right person to come in and replace Dominic Calvert Lewin when he's unavailable, which, as we saw last season, was a large part of last season. I think another player that I'll be keeping an eye on this week as well is, is Tom Cannon. We've spoken about yeah. him a fair bit this summer. You know, could he do a job for Everton this season? Quite possibly, be putting a hell of a lot of pressure on him to step up. But Evan don't have a lot of options mm. in, in, in that and we saw what happened last season when we saw the pressure pile upon Everton's kind of management team in the first half of last season as they struggled for goals and Ellis Sims was scoring them in, in, in at the top end of the championship didn't we and that obviously led to to Sims coming back in, in January and that almost felt like a move to save face as, as much as a, as a tactical decision but with a championship season starting in a week all those clubs that are involved will be wanting to get their last players in through the door. Pre- obviously, there's, there's still a fair bit of time for them to do it, but preferably they want that for the start of the season. So those clubs that are interested, we know that Preston and North End have been very keen to take him on loan back. There also seems to be a growing market of other clubs hopeful of trying to get hold of him. Stoke, apparently, one of them, I asked Alex Neal about that after the game. He, he wouldn't really be drawn on him, but he didn't exactly go, Tom Cannon, who is he? <laughs> you know, so so, so that would be an interesting one. I mean, we would, we're in danger of repeating ourselves, so we won't labour this point too much. But surely, whilst whilst we have to be careful not to put too much pressure on him, and whilst we have to be accepting that his progre- the best the best move for his best next step for his development, his personal progression, and Everton's long term future may well be for him to go out on loan again this season. It wouldn't <laughs> you wouldn't feel you you wouldn't be too reassured, would you, if they were to allow him to leave before any more strikers came in? They can't the let him leave before they sink brings off centre forward. Not. They, they can't let him leave. I mean. Just don't forget we were having a discussion last year at one point where he was scoring on a weekly basis for Preston 
and people were sitting there going, why do we let this lad leave? We can't buy a goal. Sims are struggling, Mopey struggling. Why didn't we just keep this lad around? I mean, either got a chance, we could have put him in now. You know, we could have seen what, you know, them games you think when Everton were chasing and stuff like that, they could have put him on. So that's, this was being said back in March when Everton already had two centre forwards playing plus a third of Dominic Carvalho and out injured. They can't let him go. They, I mean, they can't let him go. I will be just, uh, just I will be shocked uh, jump, if, just if jump, jumping in here right obviously we know that he's missed the last two games because he hasn't been fit he picked up a small yeah. injury if you had to if you had to pick your first choice Everton lineup right right now and say Dominic Calvert-Lewin wasn't available is Tom Cat and, and say we're, we're playing the 4-5-1 that um, Deitch has preferred so far is Tom Cannon your one at this stage He'd be more effective than Neil Bopay, yeah. so probably, yeah. And probably more effective than Dan Juma in that role. Yeah, and Lou Stobbins. And, and Lou Stobbins as well, because obviously Lou Stobbins come into the equation because he's, he's come on in recent weeks. But yeah, he probably, he probably would be, which... Th- this is the disappointing thing with Tom Cannon a little bit because it felt like this pre-season we could get a real glimpse of Tom Cannon and see what he's all about, you know. And obviously, he played 45 minutes against Stad and Leone, but Sean Dyche pretty much made it clear before that game that this was going to be two 11s and... You know, this is just going to be look. You know, minutes in the legs. We're not taking this too serious. You know, it's just a, a first game back. You know, nice way to round off the, the training camp type thing. So you then caught well. Be interesting how he does at Wigan, how he does against you know Bolton, Stoke. You know, teams who he's probably impressed against last season or played similar. You know, against the last right, season. Score goals quite com- competently against League One yeah. and League Two clubs in the in the Football League trophy. So, and obviously, we know that he did score a lot of goals. So for the you felt the like it was going to be a really good insight into how he plays. Obviously, the day Everton played the beginning, he was watching Preston against Aberdeen at deep there, which obviously set alarm bells ringing. But obviously, he's been injured since. So you have kind of feel like we've missed the opportunity to see how far he is in his development in terms of playing in, for Everton. But I think if you were to go off past history and what we've seen, then he probably would be number one. But they. Although I think going out on loan is the best thing for Tom Cannon's development. Just like Ellis Sims should have been allowed to stay out on loan last season in the Championship. He should never have been recalled. You just can't see how Everton in a position where they can sanction a deal to allow a forward to leave. Who's shown promise, who's, who's shown you know, where the back of the net is before they bring anyone in. And you do wonder as well, don't you, whether, you know, Devil's Advocate a little bit here, where them rumours about Tom Cannon potentially leaving that started early, next, early last week were around when it looked like touring might be within reach for Everton that yeah. they were in the running and they could get maybe that cup one that got obviously towards the end of the week we all knew like it was one that was getting away from Everton but you wonder whether they, the two kinds of went hand in hand a little bit in the sense of Cannon's maybe looking at Tory coming in and think well once he comes in this will be my chance to go because that's a centre forward obviously it hasn't worked out like that so yeah I think he, he probably would be number one which is again quite alarming isn't it because you know we're, we're, we're putting a kid in who's barely tasted the Premier League I mean we thought it was a desperate act when Frank Lampard threw one against Wolves on Boxing Day, didn't we? It would be an even bigger desperate act if, Frank, if Sean Dyche has to start with him on the opening day against Fulham. But yeah, going back to the original point, they can't let him go out on loan. And you wouldn't like to think that they will let him go out on loan. But going out on loan is the best thing for Tom Cannon's development at this moment in time. So it's a real catch-22 situation, isn't it? Which I think only Everton Football Club at this moment in time can create. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. Well, we'll wrap it up there. Just before we do, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody for not only for listening, but uh, quite a lot of good feedback over the last few weeks. A lot of people getting in touch saying that they've been watching and listening, giving a bit of feedback. I say hello to, to David in New York, who's got in touch with me to say that I say obviously too much, and I think. I think I'd probably agree with that and I've been wincing every time that I've said it and not been able to stop myself this week. I keep doing it. I think, uh, I think Connor would probably agree with this. We're, we're, we're print trained journalists trying desperately yeah. to adapt to a new digital world, aren't we? And we, we, won't be get, we won't be getting a BBC or ITV call up anytime <laughs> soon, I don't think. But I think we are aware of that and by all means, you know, please do send us our feedback because we're trying to learn through this as well. So we, we do want to hear from you. But thanks so much for listening. We've been the Royal Blue Podcast. We'll speak to you again on Friday after we've hopefully heard a little bit about what's going on at Mon in the Everton's behind closed doors game against Monza looking ahead to the game in front of fans against Sporting and you know hopefully in the next few days we'll have a little bit more transfer activity to talk about and hopefully a little bit more positive news as well because let's be honest I think I think we're all desperate for it aren't we but we've been in Royal Blue Podcast thanks very much for listening have a good week <laughs>